all good. Are we rolling that? Yeah. Cool. I think what makes a good movie is not only the acting, but the story as well. It shows how much, uh, how much I guess the director had, how much thought that they had put into the film. We are having a community potluck, um, and we're also our um, co-worker. Oh, and look, someone's here. <clears throat> Hello. Hello. Oh my gosh. Welcome. How are you? Did you bring bread? No, I bought turkey pies. Oh my gosh, you're an saint. <laughs> uh, sorry, can I hug you? Yes. <laughs> Thank you so much. You're welcome. Oh my gosh, this is unbelievable. <laughs> Thank you so, so, so much. Are you hungry? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Me too. It's almost ready. Yay. <laughs> this is a good opportunity to celebrate the holidays and naturally people connecting around food is you know not something yeah. that we invented <laughs> and then, um, this year i'll be 52 this year what are you doing this year mike this year i'll be 52 i'm gonna get the chief yeah what are you gonna do i don't know i feel like i feel like you know what we can just yeah move our seats back and okay. just have a drum why do we do what we do? Huh. Everybody needs a break. Everybody, man. I feel like everybody deserves a chance. With KCL's mission statement, like it just guides everything we do. Like it, it helps you plan, it helps you create. All we are trying to do is just give people living with disabilities the chance to live a normal lifestyle, to have a meaningful relationship, you know? And I think that's, that's where the drumming is just awesome because that's exactly what it does, man. In, in the drum circle, we don't have leaders. We don't have um, um, the head. Like, like in my country, they say, in the circle, you don't have a head or tail. So nobody plays the head, nobody plays the tail. There's no followers, there's no leaders. We are all equal, right? So that's that's just brilliant to me. Okay. I don't need to. <laughs> you just need to like burn yeah. the caffeine off my system, yeah. so five sets of ten. Nice. Yeah. I feel much better now. <laughs> yeah, it gets your mind going, eh? Yeah, it just kind of relaxes it a little bit, so it's yeah. like, yes. Yeah. Kind of calms it down. It's like, oh, okay, I'm gonna. <laughs> Sometimes I kind of <laughs> need something to like yeah. get my brain somewhere else, so it's oh, like, it's like, I need it. <laughs> Uh, so I can, after this, after this, I can do some more after I sure. leave. So two more sets <laughs> of five. So we can just have one of our conversations. <laughs> like usual. Like usual. The usual talk of awesomeness and fun with this guy. <laughs> did did we already start? Yep. Yeah. yeah whenever you're ready. Oh, okay. <laughs> My name is Kyra Anderson. It's 
to, uh, nice to uh, see you. I'm Sharon White. I, uh, I retired from the Association for Community Living. I worked there for 40 years and met Stan 41 years ago. Okay, Mike and I. Huh? Hmm. <laughs> uh, Mike and I are brother and sister, and we've been close, like, you know, all our lives. There you go, Joanna. Thank you. I need your wrist. Oh, yeah, right. Okay, well, enjoy the class. Thank you. You're welcome. Are you ready? I'm ready. Let's go in. I arrived in Kenora six years ago um, on an emotional note. And I had lost everything. I'd lost my lover, I had lost my house, and I was moving because of a disability. Well, we met in March of 1976 at the hospital on 4 North. That's when we met. Yeah. Yeah, and then we spent a lot of time together at meetings. And then, um, do you remember when we first met? Do you remember me coming up there and saying hello to you? Yeah. Mm. Do you remember we were both 22? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> do you remember I didn't have a clue what I was supposed to do? No. I know. <laughs> but we figured it yeah. out. Yeah, it all worked out. Yeah. How long have you guys been doing this for? Uh, I think four years, just over four years. Right, buddy? I think. Well, yeah, we met first. Yeah. yeah. Actually, no, longer. Five years. Yeah, five years. Yeah, time. there you go. Seriously? Yeah. Beautiful, yeah. Shorter back, yeah. Yeah. My take up this in the class. Oh, yeah. Okay. But they're gonna get it. They're gonna get it. Black drum. They're gonna get it. Makagi shot, take it. Makagi. Makagi. Makagi, they're gonna get it. I have a really good passion for films and all that. I hope to someday become a film director myself someday. Hoping to inspire a lot of people, I guess. The work that KACL does is counterculture because we were creating something that didn't exist. Part of our work in those days, in the early days of KACL, when I came to work in the 70s, was getting people out of the institutions. And so that was the challenge because there was a belief, both from people that, that ran the institutions and from people in the communities, that if someone had been sent to live in an institution for years and years, there must be a really good reason for that. There must be something that had to be looked after in an institutional setting. Institutions weren't created because people wanted to do something unpleasant to people's lives. They really were created because uh, it seemed like the right thing to do. Um, it, you know, we, we kind of realize now that it did damage to people's lives and also damage to the lives of people in community and families. And what we discovered when people were coming out of the institution was that there was no driving incident or issue that was responsible for people with intellectual disabilities to be sent away to institutions in the first place, which was how I ended up developing the four social myths. And the four social myths are, they, they drove institutions and they drive marginalizing people and they are that, that people should be with others of their own kind. People need to be looked after by experts. They need to be protected from the community and most importantly that the community needs to be protected from them. Those social myths took people out of their homes, took people out of their families, and plunked them away in institutions. Every social myth looks like it's what, whatever is being done or whatever is being decided on behalf of a person with an intellectual disability is for their good, is for their own good, that they will be so much better off. They need to be with others of their own kind. What does that mean, others of their own kind? What kind? What, what are we talking about? We're humans. We're humankind. Are they not humans first? And if they're humans first, they have the same um, need for intimacy and opportunity and meaningfulness that we all have. When you remove a child from their only home, the only biological family they have, their neighborhood, their community, their schools, um, 
and other children their own age. You send them miles away and you put them in an institution which is an unnatural world with uh, a whole collection of other people with disabilities. You've taken away their only chance of, of having a happy and successful life. The reality of living in an institution is that it's, it's similar to being incarcerated. It's like a jail but, but nobody committed a crime except, um, except having a label of having an intellectual disability. What was that experience like? Terrible. A lot of people that were that we were supporting at the time had really just fairly recently left um, a life of living in an institution. Okay, so here we are at Charlie McLeod Manor. This building was constructed in 1975 to house 15 people with intellectual disabilities. Hi. It was um, considered to be a vast improvement from conditions in the institution in Thunder Bay where 300 people were housed. But if you move from 300 people in, in a major institution to 15, it looks better. It does look like it's better, but really it's just moving it to a smaller scale. What we started to learn over time, and we learned this from the people that lived there, is that 15 people who live together and 15 people who go to work together and then 15 people who go and bowl together in, on Tuesday nights is not natural. It's, it's not the way anybody else lives. We still hadn't arrived at the understanding that people with disabilities thrive under the same conditions that we do and they are not happy in circumstances that are that removed from the norm. I think that it was different for community. I think that um, at that time, a, a lot of adults hadn't had a lot of experience um, being around people with intellectual disabilities. Riley, yeah. is my hair okay? Yeah, Sorry. it's great. <laughs> it's really nice. I was, I was, Get my hair. It'll be okay. Yeah, your hair is awesome as well. It was March of 1976. Stan and I were both 22. <laughs> And I had started a job as an adult protective services worker and I was um, unsure as to what my duties were going to be. I kept asking, what, what is my job going to be like? And my supervisor said, you'll find out. And then I got a call that I had um, to go to the hospital on 4 North and meet um, a fellow named Stan Williamson. And then I found out what my job was. The building we're looking at right here was built in 1983. It was the first dedicated building to house ARC Industries. Um, it, ARC stands for Adult Rehabilitation Centre. Fifteen people who lived at Charlie McLeod would go to ARC Industries every day, supposedly to learn um, employment skills that would allow them to have a different type of job. And 15 people from the community came to ARC to develop pre-employment skills that would take them into the workforce. Stana had run into a little trouble at ARC Industries and they said he couldn't come back. So he was basically fired from a workshop that was built to support people with disabilities. The problem was that there were 30 people with varying levels of intellectual disabilities coming to a building to learn work skills with about one staff to every 15 people. I talked to the doctor on 4 North and I asked if he could help me and he said to me, Stan is just one of those people that fall through the cracks in the sidewalk. Remember? Yeah. So I said, um, well, I, I don't believe that. And then Stan and I kind of started off on a journey of finding out uh, how we could help Stan learn how to live in the community successfully and um, and it took a while, it took months. The problem was the system, the way the system was set up. The problem was not the dedication of the ARC staff or or any mismanagement of the, of the program. Self-advocates came to the board, said they wanted real work for real pay, and that meant having a job out in the community where they could get um, a wage, just like you and I. Mm -hmm. And so KCL shut their workshop down, and once we closed it, we found people jobs who wanted jobs. If we fast forward now to both of us in our 60s, Stan is uh, living on his, in his own apartment, highly independent, has a job at Walmart that he's had for 10 years? No, 11 years. 11 years, been voted um, 
Employee of the Month, how many times? Two. A bunch of people, I think there were four at the time, who needed to learn some functional literacy in order to get a job. <laughs> that evolved into a literacy program for emergent learners. That evolved into uh, adult education being just what are you interested in? I'm interested in pirates and zombies. Well, when you come to us, we're going to give you an opportunity to learn about pirates and zombies uh, in a way that's going to increase some skills that you have, allow you to talk about what you're interested in. And out of that came, <laughs> I would like to be an artist. <laughs> I would like to be a musician. I would like to make movies. <laughs> All those things. It really started with four people who needed functional literacy skills. <laughs> Morning. She's a star. She's a star. She's coming. She's coming. Okay. <laughs> Ready to really give it to you? Oh yes, I am. <laughs> so are we? <laughs> well, I don't know about that. <laughs> like a movie star today, Joanna. <laughs> Let's get warmed up. The next thing that the parents are told is, you do not have the skills to look after this child. So that's where the second social myth comes in. They need to be looked after by experts. And that is the, one of the most devastating uh, of the myths because um, what that child needs is what every other child needs. And people who are doing really good work inside KCL are not experts. They are people who grew up in a community and maybe just got trained by, the, by KCL. Maybe they went to school, but they come to school at, to KCL as an artist. I'm Kristen Bailey and I am a supervisor in the Community Connections program. I'm Nadine McBride, and I'm the Inclusive Fitness Consultant for Kenora Association for Community Living. My name is Jeff Rasmussen, and I'm a consultant with the Kenora Association for Community Living. My name is Leanne Hawkins. I work at KCL as a uh, consultant, primarily in the visual arts. My name is Laura Cotton, and I'm a consultant here at KCL. My name is uh, Teso. Seven My name's Riley Scott and I'm a community consultant for KACL. I really like to be outside and active. I attended school at Lakehead University's visual arts program. I had met Deb Beverly, and uh, she knew I had a bit of a fitness back background and I was a high performance coach. I came in as a teacher and it was sort of like when you're brand new you feel like you have all of this great knowledge and information and then you get into it and you realize oh I'm actually learning here. <laughs> I've been a practicing artist. I'm going to tell you probably about three decades. I do a lot of community arts programming. Um, I do some one-on-one -on -one support um, for our consumers and host yoga classes. I'm a theater artist, a visual artist, a graphic designer, and that's it. <laughs> How does that make them an expert to work with someone who has autism? Well, it's because they are artists who know about the intense need for people to express themselves artistically. The reason why the community living movement had made so much greater progress with community integration and inclusion was because we had not allowed ourselves to become specialized and specialists. That we weren't being ruled by doctors and the medical model and psychiatrists and psychologists. We hired folks who cared and we got folks who cared to do really smart things with people to get them into community. I am a health promoter. Yoga is just something that fits in nicely with my profession and my life. <laughs> my name's Corey Ski. This is my second class, but yeah, two weeks now. I love the community and it's open to 
anybody and everybody. I haven't tried any yoga before the Yoga for Beginners class. It was, um, I had a coworker who told me about it and after my first class I fell in love. Couple of breath cycles here. Before we release that right arm back down at our side, we can unbend the right knee and extend that right leg back out to a wide-legged pose. The third social myth is that they need to be protected. And so parents who really worried about what's going to happen to my child, if my child is, is trusting and, and kind and not aware of the danger, they could be at great risk. And so parents believe that to keep their child safe, it would be better to send them off to an institution where nobody could see them, because that's what happens, right? They're out of sight. It's the eyes and the ears of the community that keep all of us safe. Safe in our neighborhoods, safe on our way to work, safe at school, safe at the supermarket. When people are removed from their communities, they're removed from the safety of the eyes and the ears of the community. And so we were kind of discovering together with the person sort of what, what community might mean for them. I think community happens anytime that there's people that come together who um, want to be around each other and enjoy one another and sort of have an interest to, that are common and a common interest to sort of, you know, care about each other a little bit. I'm with Community Connections, um, which is comprised of fitness friends, adult learning at Rhizome, and the Arts Hub. What we do with Community Connections is that we explore lifelong learning opportunities for people that are supported by KACL. Art Partners and the Arts Hub both began as action research projects, which is basically a process of observation, reflection, and action. One of the literacy consultants uh, recognized a need in some of the learners that she was working with to express themselves artistically, and um, so she began an action research project called Art Partners, which um, at that time partnered um, consumers of KACL with members of the community to um, explore art together. If we offered the community an opportunity to do art that included people with intellectual disabilities, would they come? And they did. And boy did they come. <laughs> I don't know, I think I, I enjoyed the company and uh, my art was developing even though there was no skill intended to for anyone to need to have. There was still a little bit of instruction and there was um, a theme. There's a project, a suggested project each time. And people just go about that process. Um, process being the, the key word rather than product. Usually at the end of the session we would um, have a group collaborative project to come together um, and create something painting you see behind me. The Arts Hub is located in uh, Lakeside in Kenora um, at 528 3rd Avenue South. In my opinion isn't quite just a location. It is a location but it's within the studio um, here at, at uh, 528 um, but it is also a body that can leave this particular location and be represented in other locations around town. We're gonna put the chapel in the woods. Oh yeah. And that's going to be the first piece of our discovery forest. We're doing a little gorilla gardening and we're hoping that people in the community will now discover our little creations. It serves a part of the population very well and I think when I'm in society or when in company of other people I talk about it a lot because of the meaning that it has for me um, and I'm going it's for everyone. It's you know it's not just for a specific group of people. It's for everyone to come and learn, to understand. I don't think there's, uh, you know, other than a few kind of weeks maybe out of the year, I don't think there's a week I'm not at the Arts Hub. Okay, you're gonna put it right there. It's the people, always the people that make an environment. You can, you can overcome any environment, but you gotta have the people there. And you, the Arts Hub does have the people here. It was discovered that relationships happened naturally and it wasn't necessary to um, pair people up. The second time we offered art partners, we already didn't have to match people up. We knew that was an unnecessary step. It's a little bit more meaningful when you allow it to happen naturally. People really started to, to talk to one another and really started to become friends. They're my friends. They're my, they're my, 
they're my my gang. We, we laugh together. We we at times sometimes have a few tears together, <laughs> and and we celebrate together, and we help each other, you know. And uh, um, and so you know uh, uh, it, that's in my mind definition of a friend. We stop focusing so much on our differences. We stop focusing on the labels that we have given one another. You could just gather people together around a passion or interest that they shared. And when you did, people recognized in each other, we're in common, we are like each other. We are kind of the same. <laughs> I have trouble with labels, calling people something labeled disabled or abled. I just as soon call them by their name. So if everybody's seen the same um, with their own unique abilities, um, then everybody from the community to the people we're supporting, to our staff, everybody will be seen as the same. Uh, the Fitness Friends program has been running now quite successfully for over 10 years. I had to uh, start from scratch. The whole program was uh, basically just created from scratch. Okay. <laughs> Fitness Friends, we host all over the place, but uh, it's often associated with the Kenora Rec Centre. I've been doing Zumba for seven years at the Zumba, the Zumba classes right here. What I do is I work at uh, getting people involved in recreational programming of their choice, uh, hopefully with somebody as a community participant um, to join alongside them. And then that's how I met Joanna. She said, you and Joanna will be perfect together because <laughs> she likes to exercise, you like to exercise. I still do. Nadine McBride uh, contacted me. I was training at the gym, and then I knew Tyson. So I accepted, and he's been beating me up ever since. <laughs> Get serious. I am serious. <laughs> I've been out about uh, three times now. That's really cool. It's really interesting. It's like something new. Fitness Friend program is, is based a lot on social world valorization. The intention is to valorize the person I'm supporting within the community um, with the activities they're choosing to do. When I, when I like Zumba so much, because I like dancing and getting fed and people working out so much. Me and Tyson get together um, once a week and we do some weight training and some cardio and we do some martial arts training as well. I'm gonna get knocked out on TV. <laughs> so I give them a lot of support in terms of, you know, how to get into the activity they want. Nadine did a workout for us. We used to go to the gym and then once Zumba started, we started going to Zumba and, and Joanna loved Zumba. So we would go as much as we could. She was a natural at Zumba, or is a natural <laughs> at Zumba. She's and I still am, so. Good with it. Yes, and she still is. <laughs> but once they're in it, and especially once there's been um, somebody who's been available to join them and that relationship is formed, that's when the magic really happens. <laughs> it is very social. Yes, we see a lot of the same faces, but we always have new people coming and trying it. Do you ever do other stuff with Nadine? Uh, yeah, I also like do uh, workouts. Very, very fun. My role is most successful when I'm able to step back and the two partners are able to step forward. I think we enjoy it because we both share a common interest in wrestling. Yes, um, yes. And we both like to practice the moves that we see on TV. I would say that there's healthy competition between friends. Yeah, that's right. There we go. I look forward to it. And I find that I probably get more out of it taking Joanna than she does going with me. I, I, I just kind of makes my day. It makes me happy to take her, and and she's just yeah. a pleasure to be with. Who's your favorite wrestler? Get on the ground. What? What? Yeah, I need to know what's going on. Get on the ground. Okay. Right now. When you see the two of them together, like the instruction and the learning and the knowledge that's shared between the two of them, uh, when you see them working out together, it's really something special. And, uh, and you can tell that both of them are benefiting it. Both are benefiting from it. Both of them are really enjoying that experience. Oh. Who does that move? Kurt Angle. Kurt Angle. Well done, buddy. <laughs> Kurt
Currently, I'm working out of the Seven Generations Manidu Bawatig campus. We're renting a space there, and we call the space Rhizome. Rhizome was kind of the end product of a few years of development and kind of reimagining the adult literacy program. It doesn't look like a typical classroom in the building. We do have like a, a couch and, and also a table to gather around and eat. Morning is typically one-to-one um, -one work, so we'll have scheduled learners, um, many of whom were with the adult literacy program previous to Rhizome. And sometimes uh, I like to go to the Rhizome to explain them some story ideas to a friend of mine named Teso. I happen to be in the works of writing a bit of a novel. And then we've left that afternoon a little bit more open. Um, so we're trying to kind of meet the needs of a few different populations that KCL supports. So today we can harvest some of the onions. See how now they've, they're starting to turn brown? Okay. They're getting, <clears throat> their paper has come in. Over a number of times, you're developing and deepening relationships with people. So you get people coming back every week and it's familiar to them and they can relax. Because when people come in and they say, I want to uh, get my grade 12 or I want to learn to drive, there's so much learning uh, that happens between uh, meeting someone and building that relationship together and then moving into community to have opportunities to learn. I know there's some overgrown pukes in there. Oh, Kixis, you're one of my favorite. Yum. I saw opportunities of connecting the, especially the youth that we're supporting that just really needed to understand where their food comes from, why it's important to eat good food, and teach people that it's really accessible. And um, so I'm just, I'm passionate about growing food and eating good food and um, just very grateful to have this opportunity to work in this way. Being that it's adult learning, it's quite open in terms of what we learn. So someone might want to learn how to um, use social media, that kind of thing. So they're doing that reading and writing piece, but it's also being put to use in their daily lives. Think for seeds for a second. We're gonna uh, spick it seeds from Garrick. Underneath the ground where the asparagus pops out, there's like a big root system. And when that plant gets old enough, then you can cut it and divide it into chunks. Oh. And then you share, so it's one of those things that's shared amongst people. Rhizome is the adult learning space for KCL. We've borrowed some of the techniques from, or the ways of working from the Arts Hub. That's good. Yeah. But it's not tight, like I did. Um, so my experience here at Rhizome was, it, looks tight. it was really great. Like when I first agreed to do it, I was really nervous and I actually didn't think that I was kind of qualified to be doing it because I don't, like even though I do art, I don't think of myself as like a teacher. Like the Hub is, it does arts-based programming, right? We're looking at the learning aspects of that. I am making dream catchers. <laughs> We did feather holders, walking sticks, and then an elder came. He said that um, native crafts used to be hidden, and it was something that wasn't really talked about. And he said now he sees that it's coming out more, and we're passing it on to people, and um, it's, it's important to do that. We're also all doing our lifelong learning side by side. I think that as long as we have opportunities to have experiences and to be part of something uh, collectively with, with people we care about or in our community around things that interest us, they, it just creates so many more opportunities for lifelong learning. After the elder said that, I kind of realized that it was a little bit more important than I thought. <laughs> So I, I kind of, I feel really honored that I was able to do it. Beauty. I think that's gonna be good for today. We're gonna leave the rest. Okay. Yeah, we're just gonna let them keep getting bigger. The fourth social myth, the fourth reason why people are sent away is that we need to be protected from them. There's a fear that they will be dangerous to the general public. At some level, there's this fundamental fear of people who are different 
people who challenge us. The best definition I ever heard of people with challenging behavior are people who um, make us mad, uh, scare us, or repulse us, right? And it's all about us. It's about our reaction to them. And so there is there's this idea that that if they were looked after by experts in some other place that we didn't have to worry about it, that we'd be, we'd be safer. Well, I guess it's up to you guys if you want to keep this in the documentary or not, but I'm going to say it anyway. <laughs> I want to be able to show many people like us that, um, that you can achieve anything if you choose to. I guess all you have to do is just open up and reach out and stay committed. I did mess up a lot, but kind of made me stronger and more powerful and more awesome <laughs> as a human being. So, but we're only afraid of people that we don't know. We have to look into the eyes of a stranger and see that they are us. And if we never see them, we're never going to know that they're humans just like us and have the same needs that we do. And as long as they're strangers and scary because they're different, you don't have to have an intellectual disability to be an other and to be different and therefore to be scary to somebody. Um, Miigwebenesh is the cause of My name is Thunderbird. I'm from Name, clan of uh, Sturgeon. And I come from Wajashkunigam uh, Neonjiba, from Rat Portage, uh, northern shores of Lake of the Woods. My experience here at the uh, KCL Arts Hub, I found out a lot about myself during this time here. I'm uh, just a community member that uh, grew up here all my life and uh, went through uh, quite uh, serious health issues with uh, with my heart uh, uh, back back in 2009 and uh, devastated me. It, 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 the culture, the uh, my family, uh, my my surrounding family, nothing seemed to uh, pull me out of this uh, depression. And then a staff member here invited me, a musician, invited me here to, they called it a jam night. I remember walking in the doors and I've, I've felt the overwhelming acceptance, honest acceptance. I felt the respect, I felt the feeling of uh, being welcomed. And it was several visits after that I started to change. My attitude changed, my appearance changed, everything at home started to change. The love was uh, ignited. And it was the people here, the, the uh, staff and the clients, uh, consumers, I guess they call them here, <clears throat> that had that impact. And it took me a while to figure out all they did was uh, act the way they do, which was a uh, straight up, honest, respectful way. And that love was the thing that helped me uh, see the light. I was actually somebody again. I just came here to be myself and continue to do that. Continue to come and enjoy the company of uh, the people. The gift that people with intellectual disabilities bring is that is the realization of what is most important, which is human relationships and friendships and looking out for each other and supporting each other and um, giving back. Being patient and finding the right people you can trust and who is not going to judge you, who you are, mostly accept who you are and 
love you who you really are as a human being. There are people out there who are looking for those kind of people. And I'm one of those amazing people on this planet who's willing to help. <laughs> I see the Arts Hub as enabling me to feel human again because I didn't feel human. I definitely have found home here. Those of us who have one gift give back to other people who don't have that gift we have. And from them we get a gift that they give to us that we don't have. And that's, that's the reciprocity that people with disabilities bring. And when you remove everybody who has that ability to teach us that from society, we're less, we're, we're worse off. Happy Jacob. Happy Jacob. Happy Calvin. <laughs> you go because there's people there that you want to spend time with. I love it here. I love the atmosphere. I love the people. I think that more people should come to these types of workshops because art is kind of like healing. It's also helped me develop some relationships and friendships and, and feel like I belong somewhere. We had a good, good time together. There's some sort of spiritual connection between us because on my worst days, my phone would ring and I'd answer it and Stan would say, Sherry, want to go for coffee? <laughs> and I say, Stan, I'm having the worst day. How did you know? And he'd say, I know, I know. I'll cheer you up. I think being with Joanna has kind of brought me back down to, to earth to know that the important things in life are friendship and love for each other and being kind to each other. So she has that's been what I think she's brought to my life. She's brought real uh, joy to my life. And I think that, um, you know, I'm very lucky that she's my friend. Me too. <laughs> How does it feel for you, Jacob, to play music, to play your drum? Ah, uh, Baba B and uh, George Jones play, at, uh, play the guitars. It's a good place, this hub. It's got the energy it needs and that we need to keep keep it going for people. Be good. None of those myths are true, but it, but they're so strongly held on to, it becomes woven into the fabric of what everybody knows to be true, right? Everybody knows it, so it's beyond question. You don't question it or challenge it. You don't say, uh, that doesn't sound right to me, because somebody will, will say, well, everybody knows. Here you go again, you say you want your freedom. We've come a long way. I was working for Art Partners when the last institution closed. Um, in Ontario, um, but we have a really long way to go um, in really incorporating all citizens into community. I think we're on our way. I don't think we've figured everything out. I think that we still have growth to make. I think that we're ever evolving and that if we stay where we are and think, okay, our job is done, then we're in for some serious problems. You get into the work and then opportunities come up. So it's taking that risk at the beginning because you don't know what opportunities will come at the beginning of it. So just like artists have to trust a process in order to be creative and, and create something, I think we, doing community development work, we just need to trust the process and trust community. It is a constantly evolving, moving target. You never, you never arrive. To me, I think that's really what lifelong learning is about. It's not about the final goal. I think it's about the connections you make and the experiences you have with other people. And that's what's most important about it. We were constantly amazed at the, the resilience and the, and the um, resourcefulness of people who once given a chance taught us how much they could do and how well they could do. They showed us, give us half a chance and we'll prove to you we can bring gifts to community that nobody else brought and we can show you how to make a full society with contributions from everybody. We're social animals, we all are. Uh, we belong together. Uh, we learn from each other, we look out for each other. Who are you interested in helping? Uh, the people who have 
whole time in their lifetime who has, you know, problems or who thought of suicide. And those are the people I want to help. Inside me, I am, I am, it's happy, look like a bird. I am, look like a flying around, look like a eagle. When I'm in that element of the culinary, and when I'm in the element of my music, I'm not disabled. I think that we know um, the consequences of people being isolated or segregated or um, on the margins. I do believe that people uh, with disabilities are safer um, when they're surrounded by caring connections with people. Are you going to come to my wedding? I am going to it's at the Vernon Nature Trails on September 30th at 3 o'clock. Let me have a golf game, Papa. You better be there. What? A golf game? <laughs> you better be there. You can dress up like a wrestler. If Brittany asks, tell her I gave you permission. I am. Okay, perfect. And I like singing and making jokes and stories. And I want to be a singer someday. I want to be like Laura Cotton, be on stage. Things are going to change in the future too, and what we know is that we don't know, we don't have all the answers. We got as good as we could get for our generation. I think that the coming, the future generations are going to do way better than us. I already are. I always tell myself, as I'm getting nearer to retirement, that um, the future will be different from the past, um, but it, it's going to be a very exciting future. Change is good, so change is not your enemy. <laughs> Some people think it is, <laughs> but it can't be your best friend. Right? So I hope I'm part of that. And uh, that's all I have to say. <laughs> Institutions were easy to fight against. You could look at people in horrible conditions and go, nobody should live like that. But nobody should, should live the way many of the people that we serve are living now either. They are impoverished. They don't have housing, um, they are uh, traumatized, they're considered by many of our actions uh, disposable and discardable, and we just don't believe that anybody's disposable. When the rain washes you clean your The thing that motivates me more in in my work, right, mm -hmm. is the fact that what we are doing works. It's it's hard to describe it, but it's 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 just it's just amazing how you see, especially for the consumers, you it's. You meet them every day, and it seems like we are not making any heads way, and you almost you almost start getting impatient. And then sometimes you go and you get feedback, and it's just like wow, like we are getting through. It's working, right? And and like I said, like in, in the drum circle, I've seen a consumer come and he's shy and would not just sit in the circle. He would not touch the drum, right? And now he's a co-host. Like, go figure. <laughs> yeah, that will make me come back tomorrow, man, for sure. <laughs> More motivated, man. So I think that's really the essence of the work. It's all working towards the same thing. It just looks different. It's just a whole bunch of different ways and experimentations of trying to do the exact same thing, which is to connect individuals with one another. That's all.